congratulations, Mr. Red Pilled Man. You broke your wife down. It's okay. She needed it. Have a plan for what comes next. Mids Watch, guys, welcome. I'm going to do a follow up. Uh, one of the last episodes I had on the Mids Watch was about a guy who was understanding the idea of the wife's bad behavior breaking her down, building her back up, but he didn't know how to build the back up and reward for good behavior or to encourage the kind of behavior that made everybody in the family happy. And this is another great example about that. It's a guy early on in his thing too. Again, seven years ago, the most prolific red pill poster ever, Mr. Deleted. Typical though, two week warriors. I, one thing I do like about the two week warriors is they are such great cautionary examples, man. They really are. Anyways, so you've been helping one of the guys with an Oak versus Rock situation, which was the last one we had talked about. And I had one come up last night, although I thought I handled it okay. Her reaction said otherwise. Um, backed her up. She's from a family. Stepdad is fairly beta male, but somehow comes across as the Oak a lot. Mom is irrational at best. Me and my wife had a main event, I think, where she told me that whatever journey it was going on to help myself was hurting her and our marriage. She asked about the gym starting to wear a shirt and tie to work. They're getting involved with some extracurriculars. This is like a month ago. And then at uh, one point we had a fight where she was talking to me saying, if I don't go to the sweet boy, back to the sweet boy she met and fell in love with, she would leave even though, you know, the love she felt for me was gone and I lost my shit inside. I told her I had allowed that boy to wither away because I was too busy doing shit that I thought would make you happy. And now I'm doing things for me. Ultimately, it's going to make this thing work anyway. So fast forward a month, following my male action plan, she's been doing a lot of things I expect a stay home wife to do. When she forgets to do something, she sees me do it or whatever, she apologizes. And it's like, honestly, for things that aren't a big deal. So whatever. Last night, I answered her in a shitty tone about two contradicting requests. Stupid of me, I get it. And I didn't ca catch it fast enough. Uh, this started crying. In the last month, she realized my love wasn't unconditional. And yes, in fact, if I'm not happy, I will leave. Uh, she says she's been walking on eggshells, trying to make me happy, etc. So conversation after I give her a hug and a kiss, you know, and then deeply say, look, she's like, look, I need you. You complete me. You're my soulmate. He goes, look, I love you too, madam. I chose you. I'm keeping you. And her is like, you know, but you don't need me. He goes, I don't need you. I want you. And then there's some more crying and more hysterics about what I did say I needed her for in the past. And she can't handle the new him. He's too cold, doesn't love her enough. She knows about that she's been a shit, but he needs to give her a break. And the night shift ended on a pleasant note, though. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions in advance? Um, I just remembered what this one was. So I know whose report this is. I know what happened to him. I know why his thing was deleted. And I know how this ended up. Um, they broke up. They did break up. It was pretty... But that's not, um, it's not because of this. What it really was is she truly just didn't want to do what she had to do to get in there. And he moved on. He was a doctor out of uh, New York State. I don't want to say exactly where, but um, he ended up, and he's like a short guy. He's like five foot four or something like that. He ended up younger, tighter, like life got a lot better for him, but um the point of this isn't that the point of this is to let you know, like, first off, there's no guarantees. You can work on this stuff. You can become a better Oak. You can be better with, uh, attracting behaviors. You can be better with, uh, comfort behaviors. You could become the best husband there is out there. You can do all the things you're supposed to do, right? It's no guarantee. You're going to win your wife back. It's no guarantee. She's going to want to win you back. It's no guarantee that once you're there, you're even going to want her to come with you. Uh, I don't want to go into too many details about why they split up, but it's nothing to do with this anyway. So then anxiety she's feeling here is something called the main event. Now, a main event is a specific process in the male action plan where um, a guy starts to build his own attractive behaviors. He starts to become, you know, do extracurriculars, gets more female attention, works out at the gym better. All this stuff is better. And the girl doesn't know where she fits in her life in that life anymore. And because she's not being good, 
she's not getting any comfort from him. And so it builds up a, a pool of anxiety and it eventually blows up into like sobbing and snot bubbles and all this stuff. It's essentially a direct last minute Hail Mary approach to like, I don't know how to keep you in my life. How do I get comfort from you? To which point you provide something that's called a come to Jesus speech. And a come to Jesus speech is your way of letting her know what do you have to do to keep in my life. And more often than not, it's a very simple speech. You know, you just describe out, you lay out your vision. And if you uh, are seeing this after the fact, I've got a book somewhere in the description on frame, which is based on like this concept here. This is technically part of dread, but it's not the point. The point is to have not only a vision of where you're, you see yourself in the future, but to be able to articulate it. And the idea is you're bringing the other person into your part of life. And that's where the trust thing comes in. And this is like, for the most part, he passed it. Just letting her know, you know, love's not unconditional, whatever. Oh yeah, the, I didn't catch it fast enough. So this is something else. This is something for more, I'd say beginner guys. It's good to know. So when you first start learning uh, red pill stuff, you start learning about frame, about comfort tests, about shit tests, about dread, about all this stuff, you're gonna go through a, pr a learning process through a cycle, which I call an OODA loop. That's observe, orient, decide, act. It's a concept I've stolen from Venkatesh Rao, who stole it from the American Air Force. The idea is you run through this cycle more quickly to maintain superiority in your decision-making process. So the first time you get a shit test or a fitness test or anything, and you don't know what it is. So you're messing up and you don't know why you're messing up. And so you're like, I don't know what's happening. Why is this thing such a shit show? And then you learn about the concept and you screw up again. But once you screw up, after you've had some time to reflect on it, you're like, oh, okay, I get it. I know why I screwed up. How do I not screw up in the future? Then the next time they run into the same situation, they screw it up, but before they finish, they stop themselves and stop screwing up. Basically they're, you know, they're cutting off the bleeding. All right. You're in the middle of opening your mouth, saying something stupid. You're just like, you know what? Never mind. Move on to your thing. That's a third step. Fourth step is you're about to open your stupid mouth and say something stupid and screw up your situation and you stop yourself before you make the mistake. Then the last step is where you no longer need to be cognizant of it. It just becomes natural where you just don't screw up. And it's a, it's a process. It's a long process. But once you get there, you get there. Obviously him, he was in the middle where he knew he was going to screw up and he stopped himself before it got bad. So it's good steps, but it gets there. Uh, so to Jack's thing later on here, let's get, let's get up proper. There are countless moves where the protagonist's main character has some dick or bitch boss who is insanely exacting expectations. But it's not the expectations that are so frustrating, it's the inconsistency. The main character bends over backwards to make everything perfect. The boss still rolls in and finds some deficiency that's fallen short of perfection. It's frustrating for the protagonist and usually the movie involves them breaking down at some point and crying, what do you want from me? Sound familiar? By the way, this is actually before we articulated and understood the concept of the main event. So it's neat to see it in like a primordial form. Like he's like, this is actually amusing to me. I'm sure you got a lot of satisfaction out of your little monologue there. You know, well, you want that sweet boy? Well, he's dead. You killed him. You told him what you want to do and he did it. And you still shot on him. So now there's just me. How do you like them apples? You know, and I'm sure you watched her devastation before your eyes. And although you didn't really like to admit it, probably felt good. But now you have a devastated wife. You broke her and maybe swallowing the red pill was always going to involve a shit test or responded by breaking her to some extent. But now she's coming to you crying because she has no idea how to put herself together the way you want. So what's the next move? You might have wanted to think about that before you lost your shit internally. Although to be honest, I don't blame you. Married Red Pill has basically zero prescriptive advice when it comes to this scenario. Some guys don't really have to break their wives, just captain up. Other guys do break them, but their wives are emotionally intelligent enough to figure out how to put the pieces back together. And this is why I keep seeing so many guys come here with posts like, you know, this and half the comments are basically, yeah, fuck that bitch. Just proves it's working. Keep doing what you're doing. And I just roll my eyes every time. Now, charitably, I think they say this because their wives are capable of putting themselves back together in the way yours isn't, so they don't have that perspective. Uncharitably, I think it's some dudes are still stuck in the anger phrase who would love to have their own that sweet boy is dead moment. But whatever. 
If I really wanted to write some generalized theory on the idea of breaking your wife down and putting her back together, I'd close this box and go write that. But we don't have enough scholars among us who can decide whether the theory has any merit. So let's get back to your situation. By the way, we do have enough scholars to come to this conclusion. And yes, the idea is the main event. The main event doesn't always happen, but when it does happen, there's always snot bubbles attached. And the come to Jesus events, the hardest thing I've only ever seen one guy fail it. And unfortunately, when that happens, it's very hard. Trust tends to dissipate. It's kind of like the go or no go situation. But back to this, uh, we say act a non verba all the time, but I think there's a decent chance that some of our wives let their hamsters run so wild. They get lost in the maze. That's your wife. You've made it clear to the point of being stupidly explicit that you don't need her, but you do want her. What you fail to do is communicate the answer to this question. What can she do to ensure you'll always want her? And it's difficult to communicate this with actions and not words. At some point, a lot of us are going to get what's called a shitty comfort test. Kind of like you did here. A hysterical wife who just wants to see her husband putting emotional distance between them and only seems eager to put more and more distance. So in her mind, where does that end? Until you're just friendly co-parents? Until you're just strangers sharing a mortgage? Until she gets to the divorce papers, it's not exactly irrational for some women to have a freak out moment and wonder where the end game is. And he's like, as far as like the crying and the hysterics, I found those things are easily mitigated with the right words. And I'm going to give you some examples. You know, that sweet boy didn't go anywhere. But you think that sweet girl really wants a sweet man? Because when the sweet boy only does things he's told to or is nagged about it, well, it's not really helping him become any kind of man. And he can't become a sweet man before he becomes a man. So that's what he's working on, which it's wordy, whatever. And he has a bunch of examples, which is just different ways of wording it. And again, Jack's always had a bit of his blue pill thing, but yeah, it's, I get what he's trying to do. So when you used to learn, if you guys were ever learned like pickup artistry, a lot of it was the story. When you're telling a story to a person, you want to pepper in like displays of higher value, something that even though maybe the story is you getting beat up outside a bus station or something, you always have to add like certain tidbits into the story that show you have your shit together. Like, yeah, I was walking to this thing and the stripper I was dating at the time fell over, broke her heel. I had to go and find a shoe place like three in the morning. Like it's almost like an offhand thing that you were dating a stripper, but you're like, oh, what the hell? The guy was dating a stripper? And it's such like a nonplussed part of the story. What the hell? So Jack is suggesting this for talking with your wife, except for displays of comfort. Things that you want from a happy-go-lucky wife, things you can do to make yourself happy and loyal, which it's interesting and it should, and most guys kind of intuitively caught on to that. So when you want to hear it explained to you, and that's what these things are, this is what passing comfort tests generally can look like. Once you get to the point that you can stop shutting the fuck up and start talking, especially a main event. It's called the mother of all comfort tests for a reason. Anyways, I'm sure some guys read my examples and think they sound too beta male. Well, that's kind of the goddamn point. This is, again, a shitty comfort test. There needs to be comfort. She's freaking out because your actions have no context that she can figure out. So all you have to go and do is give your actions a context. A context that's consistent, that she understands, and that she can operate under. You notice you could substitute the word frame for context in the previous sentence. That's intentional. To phrase it another way, you're generating a lot more dread than you realize, but that dread is unfocused. She literally told you, according to your post, that she knows she's been a shit, she knows she needs to stop, but she has no idea where to start. And I think it's time to oak up and give her some reasons. So to end on this one, just realize, and it's not a common issue, but it does happen. A lot of guys have pent up like revenge fantasies, and so when their wife gets freaked out and starts deferring to them, they're so focused on how they feel, which in this case is vindicated, and they're so excited they get to teach their bitch wife a lesson that they forget what it is that the whole reason they came here because they wanted a happy life, a happy relationship, a happy sex life, all those things. Now, part of growing up and becoming red pilled is understanding that you need like if you want to be happy, you sometimes have to give up on these emotional needs for revenge and validation. And just accept that what's happened in the past is in the past. And if you're getting what you want now, just be happy with it and move forward with that. Don't worry about some scoreboard where you got to teach that bitch a lesson or where you have to make her feel as bad as you do. Or in some god awful examples where you went from a dead bedroom to a good bedroom and you're like, now I'm going to shoot the wife down and tell her no for sex. That'll teach her because all of this stuff is just self-destructive. You know, it's like the saying goes, 
If you're going to get revenge, don't forget to dig two graves. Now, yeah, most arguments you're going to get on this is people saying, well, that's not fair. Well, like, who cares about fair? Are you happy? Good enough. I'm willing to give up fairness if it means it's happy, especially if I get to be in charge. <laughs> Anyways, that's it for this one. I'll catch you guys later. Enjoy yourselves. Cheers.